Hi, and welcome back to your autism game plan. I'm Joya Vanderlaan, a family nurse practitioner, a functional medicine specialist, and an autism mom. You know, molds can make us really sick. And the tricky thing is that it can make some people sick while others feel nothing. So I wanna talk a little bit about mold today and the symptoms of mold toxicity so that you can identify those in your autistic child if they're present, and then learn a little bit more so you can decide if there's something that you can do or should do about any potential mold exposure or mold toxicity in your child. So if you do any reading about molds, mycotoxins, those are both words that you may hear, and they are usually used as synonymous. But there is a little bit of a difference that I want to point out. The molds are you know, the fungi themselves that are growing either indoors in a wet place or outdoors in a, you know, a wet place, moist, warm usually. So the mycotoxins though are the byproducts of mold's metabolism. So think about them as kind of the excretions of mold. They're toxins that the molds produce. And typically those mycotoxins are what makes us feel ill versus the molds themselves but many molds, there are hundreds and hundreds of molds, and they each produce different mycotoxins. So we can kind of see based on testing of mycotoxins, what molds might be present in our particular environment. Let's talk a little bit about symptoms of mold toxicity or mycotoxin illness. So it's a little bit tricky because symptoms of mold toxicity often overlap with things that can be any any other disease. So fatigue, for instance, is one. Well, that could be a lot of different things. Um, cognitive problems is another one. Um, respiratory issues, so maybe stuffy nose or cough or trouble breathing. Those are kind of allergy-like symptoms. So those are sort of the big three most common symptoms of mold. And remember, our children with autism tend to be more sensitive to chemicals, to molds, that kind of thing. For one, just because that's the way they tend to be, but also in with that is they tend not to detoxify well. And so somebody who maybe doesn't have autism or doesn't have a metabolic deficit in detoxification may be able to hold, handle mold better um, and not have symptoms. So this can help to explain why maybe one child in the house or one person in the house is ill, is bothered by the mold, and another child is perfectly fine. So I wanna go over a few other symptoms of mold toxicity. The three that I mentioned first, fatigue, brain fog, respiratory symptoms are the most common, but those are tricky, like I said, because they can be associated with so many other disease states or problems. So here's a list of some other common symptoms of mold toxicity. So we talked about fatigue, brain fog, memory impairment, um, word finding difficulties. A lot of times there's weakness or achiness, joint pain, cramping, um, like muscle cramps, uh, frequent urination or increased thirst. Sometimes they'll even have neurologic signs like numbness or tingling, sometimes unusual skin sensations like bugs crawling under their skin um, or itching for no reason. Um, many times, like I had mentioned before, with the respiratory issues, there's congestion, shortness of breath, nasal stuffiness, sometimes red eyes, so very common allergy symptoms. And then vision, blurry vision is a really common um, symptom of mold toxicity. Sometimes there's a sharp and sudden increase in weight, so the person gains a lot of weight very fast. And then also gut symptoms, like our kids with autism often will have anyways, but things like loose stool, diarrhea, constipation, so watch out for these symptoms in your child with autism or any child, any person in the house and see, you know, could mold be an issue in your house or in their school or at church or wherever your child is a good amount of the time? Are they being exposed to mold anywhere and are they reacting to that mold? Commonly, we understand that mold can grow wherever there has been a water leak. So for instance, basements are a common place to find mold in a home or in a building. But that's not the only place mold can be found. We have to remember that mold can grow in warm and dark and moist environments. And so think about what other things are stored that way. Well, grains, some of our foods, coffees, teas, 
So anything that's made from grains, so like cereals even, or breads or crackers, anything that's made from those grains, often peppercorns or dried um, herbs, dried spices, that kind of thing, because they have been stored. And if they've been stored improperly, even for a time, mold can start to grow. A big culprit, and this shouldn't be an issue for our kids, but think about it for us as parents, is coffee. So, um, you know, you want to buy a type of coffee that you know have, has been screened for mycotoxins. So you think that mold might be an issue. Well, what can you do about it? The first step really has to be finding that mold source and eliminating it. This is much easier said than done um, if you're finding mold in your home, you know, that can be a big project to get rid of it. But it's really important to get rid of it even before you start treating any other way. Because if you try to take herbal treatments or supplemental treatments or even prescription treatments before getting rid of the source of the mold, it's like pouring gas on the fire while you're trying to put it out with water. It's just, it's not going to work. So the other thing is you want to make sure after elimination of the mold from the environment, whether that's school or home or church or therapy center, wherever, is you probably will be started on binders. So what are binders? Well, they're things like charcoal and sometimes cholestyramine, which is a prescription, actually cholesterol medication. The idea behind these binders is that the binder grabs onto the mold and brings it out of the body. So as a way of detoxifying the mold. Now mold can be very tricky in more ways than one. It can evade detection, but it also evades our immune system. It actually has ways that it cripples our immune system so that our systems, our immune systems cannot detect or attack or eliminate it. And it really affects our immune system. It's really tricky um, in that way. And it can actually make our immune systems malfunction in other ways, which can be one of the reasons why people with mold toxicity, people who are sensitive to these mycotoxins are so sick and they have such a variety of crippling symptoms. Think of our kids who have, you know, this brain fog or GI, the gut um, imbalance, all these things could be related to mold. So it's important to be aware of this to see if it might be worth looking into for your child. So three action steps that you can take right now are as follows. Do you notice a smell or do other people notice a smell when they come to your house? This would be kind of like a musty, moldy smell, kind of like a basement smell. Um, you know, do you notice that in your house? That could be a sign that there's mold. Or are you having to use air fresheners and candles and plug-ins and sprays to mask certain smells in your house? And what are those smells? Could that smell be mold? And then thirdly, Look for signs of water damage in your home. Is there, are there water stains on the walls or ceilings on the drywall? Can you see kind of water stains from past water damage or current water damage? Look for signs um, of either current or past water damage. That's really important. So I hope you've learned a little bit about mold toxicity. Thanks for joining me again on your autism game plan. Until next time, remember, be gentle with yourself. You're doing a great job.